All right. So uh, you have an article that came out uh, last month in uh, Commonweal uh, called uh, Is Bronze Age Pervert Born to Rule? So um, so I guess two part question. Is he? And uh, and 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 who who is this weirdo exactly? Well, I'll invert the questions, right? So, um, Bronze Age Pervent is widely regarded to be Costa Del Mario, right? Uh, who was a Ivy League educated political theorist who wrote a thesis, uh, basically arguing that all the arguments, uh, all the positions against hierarchy uh, that Plato stakes out and his various works are, are actually a kind of screen uh, for his real views, which are actually supportive of hierarchy, right? Uh, he has a kind of explicit lesson which is pro-justice pro-needing you know to dedicate yourself to higher order concerns and then an implicit lesson which is that actually all of those explicit lessons are, are all just there for the plebs uh the real lesson is that you know power is what makes the world go around uh after you know a couple of years taking a few board stabs at an academic life um he disappeared for a long time uh, and then you know late 2010s uh bronze age pervert arrives with a manifesto, right? Uh, Bronze Age mindset, which quickly became really popular uh, in the kind of fringe right circles, uh, but actually received some surprisingly respectful reviews, right? By people like um, Michael Anton, right? Who pointed out that there are problems with the book and it makes them concerned, but nonetheless, it articulates a very engaging kind of right-wing worldview. Uh, and in Bronze Age mindset, you see a lot of the stuff that was argued for in the earlier thesis uh, delivered without any kind of inhibitions, right? Now, this is very much not a straightforward book in the sense that it's kind of an academic treatise. Uh, it's kind of a mix of lifestyle advice, autobiography, uh, trolling the libs, um, a lot of disingenuity, let's put it this way, uh, coupled with, surprise, surprise, a defense of ultra-masculine hierarchy, uh, a ridiculing of the left and its impact, uh, and a really, really, really uh, disturbing kind of argument for uh, frankly, breeding, right? Uh, they need to kind of breed a master race in the future. Uh, since then, you know, it's gone on to have a huge influence uh, across the young right, let's just call it that, the young new right, uh, where people have pointed out how, you know, you see congressional staffers in Republican offices who are reading the book, talking about it, that kind of stuff. Uh, and Costin's kept busy, right? Uh, he runs a podcast. Uh, he just published the thesis under his own name not too long ago and briefly rose to the top of the Amazon bestsellers list. Uh, and who knows what it's going to come up with next? Nothing good. I can tell you that much. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of um, a name that I felt like I kept running into for a long time, although I didn't really have a good sense of uh, who, you know, who he was or, uh, or, or what exactly he was arguing for. But uh, he's somebody who like a certain kind of, honestly, I think like, maybe the most apt way to say it is just right-wing hipster was really yep. into, right? Like, that's, uh, uh, like, like I'd hear, uh, like the, the red scare girls drop references to, him. or, uh, I remember a little while ago, I read, uh, the, um, Matthew Gazda, Gadza, uh, his, uh, his, uh, dime square and other plays, right. Which is, um, uh, this collection of plays that uh, the the title one uh, is about this uh, this sort of literary uh, artistic scene in New York that you know kind of came up around uh, twenty twenty uh, and you know there have been like a zillion like profiles about it and stuff because it's a you know mm -hmm. the the world of uh, of a certain kind of New York literati person is like claustrophobically small. They're all interested in each other uh, to a much greater extent than they're actually interested. In. But in the uh, in in um, in the uh, in the introduction to to this book by uh, by by somebody like Christian Lawrence, uh, he uh, he uh, Lorenzen, he uh, he said, you know, he started talking about the the scene getting you know like more like, you know, uh, political in, in ways he found, you know, found off put in. And, uh, and, and now this is an example that you'd see like bronze age mindset poking out of, you know, knapsacks. Uh, and so like, that's the, that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, that's, that's like the kind of reputation of the book. And I, th I think it kind of, uh, I think that sort of vibe 
uh, that that tends to to attach it to this. Um, like uh, I saw God a while ago. I went to this debate. It's actually on YouTube now. We'll probably do a breakdown of it at some point. Uh, but uh, I went to this debate in LA uh, that was hosted by the Free Press. That was uh, was the this is one of those things where it sounds like I'm describing a weird dream I had, but like this, this was, <laughs> this was like a real thing. It was, uh, it was, uh, the, uh, Sarah Hader and, uh, Grimes, uh, were, uh, were debating, um, Anna Karkachian from, from Red Scare and Louise Perry about the, the sexual revolution, uh, and, um, and I remember Anna Karkachian had, to, uh, like, like, like dropped like a draw bronze age pervert, uh, reference and in, in her, her opening statement. Right. You know, cause, cause I, I think that the, you know, like the general vibe I've managed to pick up from all this is that like, this is supposed to be this kind of like edgy repository of, you know, truths that there's probably a, they with a capital T that don't want you to read. Oh, absolutely. Right. Uh, I mean, I want to be clear, right. Um, Fab is a hard figure to pin down in no small part because there are layers of dissociation and ding- disingenuity uh, in Bronze Age mindset, uh, which you have to kind of peel back. Right. I think John Gans is right that a lot of the more offensive stuff in the book was designed to serve two functions. Right. One is to trigger the libs. Right. That's plenty right. of reason for itself, uh, particularly centrist libs uh, who will focus on its racism, its misogyny, uh, you know, its homophobia, uh, and this will draw attention to the book and to the author. Uh, but I also agree with Gans that part of the reason for that uh, was because it distracts from the real message of the book, which is aligned with the racism, the homophobia, and the misogyny, right? Uh, but from Bap's perspective, is a little bit deeper, right? Uh, and he's very much inspired by this kind of Nietzschean outlook uh, in life, you know, not, you know, the kind of Nietzsche that, you know, Foucault or Deleuze is arguing for, but the Nietzsche, the aristocratic radical, right? The person who argued that slave societies and slave cultures are, are the ones that produce the highest forms of culture and the highest orders of men, right? Uh, or the Nietzsche in the will of power who declared that you did not yet grant the mass of men the right to life, right? Because, you know, there can be even unfit peoples. Uh, so at the epicenter uh, of Bap's worldview uh, is this belief that, Every society needs to have a kind of ruling masculine elite. Um, And he's pretty indifferent to really what that elite does uh, as long as it's present, right? Uh, In a 2001 essay that I referenced uh, in the piece, uh, Communitar Fools, I think is what it's called, uh, he describes himself as a fascist or something worse, right? Uh, But, you know, in this, he basically says, I don't really care very much about economics. Uh, What matters a lot less than the economic mode of production or mode of organization Uh, is the fact that you have the right set of people in charge. Uh, And this is where the left becomes really problematic for him, because obviously the left has this kind of rapidly anti-hierarchical worldview from his perspective, right? Uh, But, you know, the left from his standpoint also consists of what he calls, you know, bug men. Uh, And, you know, a whole bunch of other pretty shitty insults, actually, aside, right? There's not a lot of creativity there. Uh, You know, these kind of docile, passive-aggressive, highly effeminate uh, kind of individuals that want to level society down to their level, uh, to their present position, right? Whereas instead, uh, what he wants to advance is this elite that he assumes will pursue uh, more beautiful projects, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Now, from my fucking standpoint, uh, I've watched the movie 300, right? Uh, and I've also seen, you know, pretty much every Michael Bay film in the world. Uh, from my standpoint, a bunch of fucking sweaty men going and pillaging the world uh, and raping and oppressing women, uh, not only is it really fucking boring, uh, it's just very aesthetically tedious and one note. Uh, and what you really, really start to feel when you go through a lot of BAP's work uh, is just this oppressive feeling of tedium. Like there's only one idea that he's ever really had <laughs> and he just keeps recycling it over and over again, right? Like the bug men are in charge. I hate political correctness. I hate effeminacy. Uh, I was born to rule. Uh, and if only people like me were in charge, everything would be better. Uh, and then accusing everyone else of resentment when very clearly being remotivated by not a little bit of it himself, right? This feeling that, you know, if all, but for, you know, all the inferior people uh, being in charge, you know, my greatness would be recognized. Uh, so I think he's definitely a problematic figure. Uh, and I'm not surprised that he's been 
why the influential uh, on the political right? Because if there's one thing uh, that people with a lot of power and a lot of status uh, like to hear, uh, it's that the biggest problem in society, of course, is that people with a lot of power and a lot of status just aren't being quite commended enough, especially in the United States, Ben, as I'm sure you know, right? That's really the biggest difficulty with the country right now. We just don't do enough uh, for people who have a lot of power and a lot of status. Uh, I mean, when was the last time you wrote to a billionaire uh, or you wrote to a CEO uh, who works out three times a day and just thanked him for all the good things that he's done for you? Yeah, no, that's true. Um, that's, uh, yeah, no, the, the CEOs really are not getting nearly enough love. Um, like, like this whole thing about bug men does uh does interest me so as i understand it the sort of literal idea is that um you know is that like extreme environmentalists are gonna like uh force us to 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 stop you know like stop like eating cows and chickens and stuff because that's that's uh because that's bad for the environment. And so under the future, you know, great green new deal dystopia, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to eat bugs. And like the bug man is the sort of person who would like submit to this and, you know, eat the bugs uh, when, when, when he's told to, but there is, there is something a little bit weird going on here. Cause uh, on the one hand, right. There's all this contempt for, for the bug men, you know, who are like willing to do degrading things because uh, they have uh, have told you to do so. Uh, but on the other hand, there's all this love for for hierarchy. And it's like, well, I, don't, I mean, how do hierarchies work? Like it's it's not, you know, the like like almost definitionally, there's got to be a bottom level. And, and that's where most of us are going to end up on because, you know, like mathematically, right? You know, you you can't. You know, there are going to be far fewer people at the top of the pyramid than the bottom. Like, you know, don't don't they kind of want most people to to just sort of like submissively do what they're told? Oh yeah, absolutely right. I mean, the idea of the bugman, uh, probably a close approximation that I can think of would be somebody like Helen Lovejoy, right? Uh, yeah. Somebody who professes to be motivated by compassion and professes to be motivated by you know this desire to do good by other people. Uh, but really is kind of jealous and spiteful and vindictive uh, on the inside, right? Um, and, you know, this has, again, deep roots in the far more interesting Nietzschean critique uh, of Ressentiment advanced in the uh, genealogy of morals, right? Where Nietzsche famously declared that Christianity and all kind of post-Christian doctrines like liberalism, socialism, democracy, uh, they're not really about securing rights and equality uh, and human flourishing for other individual, for all individuals. Uh, they're about tearing down uh, the nobility, right? Replacing the master moralities or the master's morality uh, with the slave morality, right? Uh, but, you know, in terms of uh, the political dimensions of this, I think you're absolutely right, Ben. Uh, I mean, and this is something that to BAP's minor credit, uh, he does acknowledge in Bronze Age mindset and also in some of his other writings, right? Where he's kind of not a fascist in the sense of believing in what Roger Griffin would call a kind of populist uh, ultranationalism, right? This idea that, well, we can have the mass of people participate meaningfully in politics because that will allow the nation to ascend to higher aesthetic levels uh, than it ever has before, right? Uh, because BAP doesn't like this kind of populist connotation to fascism. He, if anything, he's a lot more like somebody like uh, Julius Avola, right? Uh, who was, you know, a super fascist or, you know, ultra fascist, as it was sometimes described, uh, for whom fascism wasn't quite right-wing enough uh, in its classical forms, right? We need the more militant, more elitist, more racist uh, kind of fascism, right? Uh, because the Nazi and Mussolini deals were so a little too soft uh, for him, right? Uh, and as horrible as this sounds, it does raise a serious strategic problem, uh, which is, well, then when is, where is your political base going to come from, right? Uh, I mean, at least Mussolini and Hitler we're able to say all Germans and all Italians should yeah, right. <laughs> join the Italian fascist party or join the NSDAP because you're going to, part you. yeah, exactly. You're going to participate in some way in our grand political project, uh, sitting there and pitching this idea that, well, there's going to be a ruling elite. Uh, they're going to turn everyone else into slaves and they are going to be able to pursue these great domineering, violent projects. Uh, and you'll be the sheep and the victims. Uh, it sounds actually a great sell for every, anybody who, doesn't imagine instinctively that they're going to wind up being part of that elite, right? Um, right. 
I knew BAP has an answer to that too, where he says, well, then let's just kind of side with people like Donald Trump uh, or Ann Coulter or Malay, right? He actually wrote an essay about um, the new Argentine president, right? Saying, you know, because they'll give you a fair bit of what you want down the line. Not quite the real thing, but close enough. Yeah. I, I mean, this is like, this is always the amazing part of it. It's it's like the thing about how, um, uh, you know, everybody who does like past life uh, regression bullshit, like, uh, you know, somehow turns out to have been like Napoleon or Alexander the Great. And it's like, I'm pretty sure there were a lot more peasants, right? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. There, that there were uh, that there were Napoleons and Alexander the Greats uh, over the great sweep of of uh, of, of human history, um, but uh, but like why you know I mean it's like this guy is like what I mean like ultimately I mean you know I guess he's like become successful as like an author of screens about this now right but like separately yep. from that right I mean he was like a you know I mean it was kind of a want to be academic i mean like you know what like why you know like, like what is it about that background that screams like i'm definitely going to be one of the chosen few who would be on top of a super hierarchical society oh absolutely right i mean i point out in the article that the sense you get is that he was born comfortably middle class uh yeah. fat and intellectual and he never really forgave the world for that insult right <laughs> uh, and you can at least give him this in that respect in that respect alone He's kind of like Nietzsche, right? You know, uh, right. a sick, nebbish, intellectual guy who dreamed, who has had real problems with women. Boy, oh boy, did Nietzsche have a lot of problems, you know, attracting women. Uh, who dreamed of being a Superman, right? You know what I mean? Uh, and constantly tried to project that ideal onto himself and resented the fact that he fell short of it, right? Uh, and so ultimately my feeling is that if you read BAP carefully and extensively, and boy, oh boy, did I have spent a couple of months doing that, and I don't recommend it to anybody, uh, there is an initial fascination, right? Uh, I will say when I was reading Bronze Age Manifesto, there's this kind of M&M-ish quality to it where you have a couple of chuckles at how he's playing around with all this DEI language and just doesn't give a shit for it. Uh, and you're kind of like, <laughs> but then, you know, it quickly starts becoming a little bit more like latter day M&M, like relapse era M&M, uh, <laughs> where, you know, you just get the sense that there's this aging troll out there really claims to declaim and not care about, you know, centrist liberal opinion, uh, but at the same time, desperately, desperately wants people to be offended by what he's doing. And the kind of affect that that conjures very quickly is boredom and being a little bit sad, right? You're like, mm -hmm. you're fucking, you know, uh, a smart guy who went to Yale and, you know, could have maybe done something that was a little bit more interesting in this. And what are you doing? You're just fucking sitting there making pussy jokes uh, and talking about how women suck when you're nearing 40, man, I mean, fucking grow up a little bit. Like, you know, it's yeah, not exactly um, Superman type affects. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, whatever, like on the one hand, uh, you know, you can, um, you know, sadly, right. The, uh, experience of history shows that you can be a uh uh like an angry moody uh art school dropout uh who uh you know moves from austria to germany and you know doesn't uh you know doesn't have a lot of uh doesn't have a lot of friends etc and still make something of yourself but uh in um but also to do that you kind of have to have mass appeal right like you know like it has yeah. to be you have to be able to say to like ordinary working class people in germany right you know this is for you right it's the this is you know it's like you know it's like that socialist stuff but it's you know it's uh it's it's not you know it's not about these petty class divisions it's about the nation you know and and you're part of the nation right you know so so this is uh this is to benefit you too whereas like a lot of this stuff seems like okay if you can imagine yourself as a member of the chosen few, then like it sort of has some flattering appeal for you. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, like if you sort of, you know, ultimately if you kind of reject mass politics or like, you know, you're willing to ally with it, you, yourself with it or, you know, tactically support, you know, your Trumps and Malays and whatever, but, uh, but you're not really willing to, um, 
that's not really what you're doing, right? You know, then um, then yeah, you you do have a big problem, like you were saying. I mean, this this kind of reminds me of like um, you know, if you uh, you know, if you listen to Mike Duncan's uh, Revolutions podcast in uh, in the season on the Russian Revolution, he's got this stuff about how you know when the czar you know, agreed to, uh, to, to hold, you know, elections for a Duma, like the, the people who are most, his people were like very conflicted about even participating. Cause it's like, it's, <laughs> what we're going to like run in elections and, you know, gonna, <laughs> like, I was that. born an aristocrat to run in no election. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, no, you're just our God given sovereign and we're going to support you. But it's like, it's like, it's like what you want us to like compete with the left in this like weird, grubby democratic politics. That doesn't sound like our kind of thing at all. You know, like uh, that's, you know, or I don't know. I think, uh, you know, PG O'Rourke somewhere has a line about how he was like, you know, disconcerted, you know, about being disconcerted about, you know, they're even being conservative student organizations because he sort of doesn't like student politics uh, <laughs> at all, right? You know, I so said it's like, it's like hearing... Well, I mean, they're welcome to disband them all, right? In fact, I encourage them to follow their principles to their logical conclusion and just get rid of Young Americans for Freedoms, all that shit, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Um, rather than, uh, uh, rather than, yeah. Uh, funding them lavishly enough that they can uh, they can they can sue uh, they can sue socialist podcasts for jokingly using their name. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I want to say that's I think that's all absolutely true, right? There, there are two last things I'd like to point out about this. Yeah. Uh, one is BAP is again sometimes held out to be a kind of therapeutic Nietzschean type figure for the right, and that he challenges uh, conventional wisdom, right, uh, and kind of pushes you to think differently about yourself. Uh, but I never found that, again, reading Bronze Age Mindset or any of his other work, precisely because if you're the kind of person who picks up a book like Bronze Age Mindset and ends by saying yes, uh, then it's probably because the book flattered uh, your ego in a very consistent way. Because as my friend Ron Beener puts it, uh, very few people who endorse a kind of hyper elitist, hyper aristocratic politics imagine that they're ultimately going to be part of the slave class, right? Uh, I mean, when was the last time you saw Richard Hanani or any of these race and IQ types being like, well, you know, in the future, you know, I'm really not all that bright. Uh, so I imagine that I will be one of those people cleaning the toilets and there'll be a, a hierarchy and I'll be at the bottom of it. But that's OK, because we'll produce beautiful things uh, as you know, and I'll play my part in that, you know, scrubbing the toilets. Right? No, you know, this book is meant to flatter the conceits of its readers. And in that sense, I don't think it challenges people in any kind of substantial way, even the way reading something like Beyond Good and Evil or mm -hmm. Thus Spoke Zarathustra really might challenge you, including challenge people who want to be, you know, aristocrats of a certain sort. The second thing that I really find extremely funny, and it is very funny about this whole might is, makes right crowd, is for a crowd that says might makes right, it's an ideology that has a really shitty track record of losing very badly, right? Uh, and BAP is a fucking classically trained political theorist. He should know if you read the Peloponnesian War, uh, that there's this big monologue in the center of the Malian dialogue where the Athenians famously declare, you know, we're not even going to bother trying to justify ourselves to you. Uh, yeah, what we're doing might seem wrong by your rights, but, you know, in this world, the strong do as they will and the weak suffer what they must, right? This classic statement of international realism. Uh, but, you know, anybody who reads the end of the Peloponnesian War knows that that pissed everybody else off. Everybody thought the Athenian cause was unjust. And then the city was you know, torn down, its walls were destroyed, it was occupied, and the empire disappeared, right? Uh, or, you know, you can fast forward to fascism, you know, quintessentially, you know, a victorious ideology, as everybody knows, right? Uh, you know, declared very similarly that, you know, Mike makes right, all these decadent leftists and liberals would never be able to stand against the might of the German people and the Italian people and their, you know, stormtrooper elites. Uh, and, you know, I seem to recall reading history that, you know, Mussolini was strung up like a pig and Hitler committed suicide in his bunker and Berlin was destroyed and the Nazis bitched and moaned a whole bunch about how unfair it was that they were being put on trial, even though, you know, they had sent millions of people to their death because, you know, they were part of Western civilization and they deserved to be treated better. So the might is right ideology uh, has a really bad track record for producing a whole fucking bunch of losers, right, uh, who just <laughs> lose everybody that they confront. 
So if you are the kind of person who reads Bronze Age mindset and come away with the conviction that, well, you know, maybe might does make right, or maybe the winner should be, uh, you know, vindicated in our society, uh, then I would suggest that you steer far away from hard right ideologies, uh, because boy, oh boy, are you going to wind up in the sewage of history very quickly if that's just where you decide to plant your flag. Yeah, there is something really weird about this, right? Like somebody you wrote about for Common Wheel previously, uh, our um, mutual whatever the hell he is, uh, Curtis Yarvin, uh, <laughs> is oh, yeah. uh, uh, like you know, also has a lot of like very like might makes right, very power worshipy uh, things to uh, to to say. You know, he's like sort of very dismissive about the idea of like authorities having to, you know, be like restricted, you know, by some rights that everybody has that, you know, they have to honor. Um, but he's also got this whole with, you know, and both of these are very, you know, are, are very characteristic of, of the right. I should sort of, add, Yarvin worshiped Bap, uh, Bap's book when it came out, right? Apparently the apocryphal story is that he held it up in front of other conservatives like it was some kind of Bible, being like, oh, right? Which doesn't really surprise me since, boy, oh, boy, if you read a lot of Curtis Yarvin's work, you'll know that he has shitty taste, right? Just beginning to end bad taste. So the fact that he would bronze read Bronze Age mindset and just think, yes, you know, you know it's just well, part of a long track record of not knowing of, uh, anything worthwhile from, you know, the trash that happens to peter its way up from 4chan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, I've I've uh, you know shared a couple of uh, Uber rides with the man uh, from uh, the weekend we did our debate, and uh, right. uh, and I I have absolutely nothing to say that contradicts any of that. Uh, but um, but yeah, right. So it's like so so, but. Right. So he he's he's on that page about all that stuff, but also very characteristically of this kind of reactionary, he's got this like deep long term pessimism. Right. Like uh, like I think, um, you know, I think one of Yarvin's uh, famous like phrases from the, the Mencius Bold, mold bug years uh, is, uh, you know, Cthulhu moves slowly, but always to the left. Yep. And, and it's like, OK, well, hold on then. Um if you have this sort of like deep romantic pessimism that, you know, that like you're always fucking losing and you also, you know, you also want to like worship power and you're contemptuous, the idea that power should be limited or whatever. It's like, okay, um, let's put two and two together here. Like, you know, it's like, why, you know, uh, like, you know, like, like why, uh, you know, why aren't you on Cthulhu's side? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's a deep contradiction that pervades uh, both Yarvin and Bap's work, right? Uh, you know, on the one hand, Yarvin points out, you know, how he desperately wants order and our current society is just far too disordered. Uh, and yet on the other hand, apparently the left has created this gigantic cathedral that dominates everyone's thought and everybody's behavior. And it's almost impossible to resist it. And I'm like, really? Because that sounds like a fucking kind of order to me. If anything, it sounds like a fucking totalitarian order. So which is it, right? Uh, right. Is the leftist incapable of establishing any kind of order? It only produces chaos. We need a good strong man like Elon Musk, who's just done fascinating things. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know, really taking it yeah. to new heights to come in and yeah. uh, deliver order. Uh, or is the left just really, really good at establishing an authoritarian regime where all dissident thought is repressed and everybody kind of knows their place and goes through their life like ants, right? Uh, and, you know, BAP is the same way, where on the one hand, the left are just a whole bunch of bug men, they're unworthy, they're producing a world of servile, complacent, effeminate men. And on the other hand, apparently, we've somehow taken over the entire world, and there's no place left in it for people like that, right? So <laughs> getting us always be simultaneously too strong and too weak, uh, not because, you know, there's any kind of logical need for coherence, but because that's ideologically necessary, right? And it is just wonderful to see Yarvin and Bap continue in the long proud conservative tradition or uh, right-wing tradition of saying, are there contradictions in my thought? Uh, well, that's fine. I'll just swallow them because the more brazen the contradictions of the thought, the deeper my thinking must be. <laughs> Isn't because I just am willing to swallow any kind of bullshit and propagate it back uh, without any kind of critical thinking whatsoever. Yeah, right. Uh, I mean, the fact that Yes, Elon Musk literally can't even run Twitter competently. Um, 
but you know you you want to hand him the keys to like the uh most powerful imperial force that's you know that's ever existed uh and and you're confident that this is going to lead to long-term stability is kind of amazing it's also I, I don't know it's like the whole weird thing about how all of these guys somehow seem to think that like the roman empire was this model of like order and stability even though if you know literally anything about roman history <laughs> like those guys had like major civil wars like every five years uh, you know, but bad, bad blood out though. You know what I mean? If you were a part of a generation and you didn't have at least one or two civil wars, you'd feel cheated, right? Because your moment in the sun, you know, was taken away from you. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like it, it just, it just seems, um, I mean, this, this might just, uh, you know, this might just be me being a bug man, but like I look out at the world and I, I see, um, you know, I see we, there are all these, um, you know, I look at, you know, your Norways and your Swedens and, um, and, and I see like low crime societies with, uh, with, with lots of social cohesion and, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, is that what we want or not? Right. Cause, cause if it is, and we're not gonna, you know, attribute it to genetic magic, uh, you know, then, uh, then that would, uh, you know, that would seem to indicate, you know, a program that none of these guys you know, are on board with. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is why I find BAP and Yarvin and, you know, all of their aesthetic ideals really just so sad and so paltry and so unimaginative in a certain kind of way. You want to worship somebody great, Fucking turn off the Zack Snyder films, right? Five views of 300 are enough. Uh, go learn about Norman Borlaug, right? There's a guy who saved a billion lives uh, through, you know, manipulating the genetics of, you know, the food that we eat, right? Uh, that's really impressive to me. Uh, or go learn a little bit about the German Social Democrats, right, who fought against the Nazis, survived in the concentration camps, went to build a thriving society afterwards, right? Uh, or somebody like Willy Brandt, right, who yeah. fled and then came back and did that that's afterwards, cool. right? Uh, these are people who really built something that was enduring, lasting, beautiful, uh, and that contributed uh, to the world and advancing the cause of human civilization, right? Uh, you know, the random Bronze Age dudes uh, who decided that it'd be a lot of fun to go and oppress the helots on a Sunday because they had nothing better to do with their time. I'm just not really all that fucking impressed. And I hate to say it, if you are the kind of person that's impressed by that, I can only say that you really need to get a life and get some experience, bro. Yeah. Um, as much as that would be the perfect line to end on, I'm just going to step on it a little bit because, uh, you know, what you just said uh, reminded me of, uh, of a passage that I've always loved from um, there's a uh, Christopher Hitchens article in Vanity Fair called Imagining Hitler, uh, where <laughs> Uh, he says, uh, he has this quote from Mein Kampf. He says, I treasure one episode in the clotted pages of Mein Kampf above all others as a young resentful loser hanging around in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Adolf Hitler was forced to seek employment on a construction site. He thought the labor beneath him and he very much resented being pressed to join a union. The lunchtime chat of his fellows was even more repugnant to his nature. Quote, some of the men went into the nearest public house, unquote, while, quote, I, I drank my bottle of milk and ate my piece of bread somewhere on the side. Uh, that's a image right there. Uh, and, yeah. uh, when they talked politics, Hitler says, quote, everything was rejected. The nation is an invention of the capitalistic classes, uh, the country as the instrument of the bourgeoisie for the exploitation of uh, workers, the authority of the laws and means of suppressing the proletariat, the schools, the institution for uh, for bringing up slaves as well as uh, as slave drivers uh, um, the, uh, uh, religion as a means for doping the people destined for exploitation, morality is a sign of sheep as patience and so forth. Nothing remained that was not dragged down into the dirt and the filth of the lowest depths. It was this said the young Hitler, which first persuaded him to study book after book, pamphlet after pamphlet, and to begin fighting back for race and nation and decency. Quote, I argued Till finally one day they applied the one means that wins the easiest victory over reason, terror, and force. Some of the leaders of the other side gave me the choice of either leaving the job at once or being thrown from the scaffold. Uh, he sloped wolfishly away, 
later to notice the beards and captains of the Viennese Jews and discover another source of lifelong resentment. Uh, one has to admire, re- admire also his early revulsion against terror and force. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this passage always strikes me, Hitchens writes, and uh, always sends me into a reverie. I think first of those solid Viennese workers who, by the ill luck of the draw, found themselves dealing with the staring eyes <laughs> of people every lunch break. Uh, yeah. Austrian, Austrian social democracy was not created by intimidation, so one imagines their patience being sorely tested before they finally told him he could uh, either clear off or uh, or be dropped off over the side. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's uh, you know just just that image of of uh, of young Hitler, um, you know, like all of his coworkers are are drinking, and he's got like his bottle of milk, and you know, and 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 he, you know, and and he, you know, he's like just nurturing this like stew of resentments because they're all, you know, uh, you know, because because they're you know they're all talking politics and they're saying all these socialist things that he hates. Uh, and then, you know, whatever, like Hitlerian tirades, he's like subjecting his, his random coworkers to be- before they're finally like, okay, dude, you, you've got to fuck off. We're done. Yeah. I know you kind of almost approach this with a combination of pity. Like who fucking does this and anger, right? Like, look, I was just trying to fucking have a nice conversation with people about actual issues. And then you got to bring all this anti-Semitic racist bullshit in here. Like just, whoa. Right. Yeah. I mean, everything I've read about the guy suggests the same. And, yeah, I mean, if you want to read Bronze Age Mindset and give yourself a headache, by all means, go ahead. But if you are more interested in learning about right-wing hierarchy of worldviews, then I suggest go back to the source, read Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morals. You'll read everything that you can learn from BAP in that, and it won't sit there and make you want to fucking die uh, of boredom within about five or six minutes. Yeah, they should put that on the cover. <laughs> All right. <laughs> awesome. Genealogy of Morals, now with a new introduction by Matt McManus, right? <laughs> <laughs> Won't make you fucking fall asleep in five minutes on like Bronze Age mindset. There you go. <laughs> You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>